Welcome to Expert to Classroom, Assessment of Student Learning. Each week we start off with discussing our outline of our time together. So we will, as usual, be doing a check-in question. This week we will do a brief presentation with activity com combined, a quick review of academic calendar and semester tasks, our teaching challenge, and the exit ticket and series website will be available on the Google form. For our check-in today, our first question is regarding midterms. How did the midterm process go? Name one unexpected aspect of submitting midterms you didn't expect. Our second question will be end game. What do the next few weeks look like? And what are your three things that need to stay on your radar? For this week's presentation on assessment of student learning, we have gathered resources from several sources, um, including Carnegie Mellon, Mount Holyoke Community College, and the American uh, Association of Colleges and Universities. We'll start off the presentation part with a quote from Carnegie Mellon University, assessing students' learning, perf learning and performance. Learning takes place in students' heads where it is invisible to others. This means that learning must be assessed through performance what students can do with their learning. Assessing students' performance can involve assessments that are formal or informal, high stakes or low stakes, anonymous or public, individual or collective. Take a moment to think about the quote. I think one of the biggest things about teaching is always just to remind us that it isn't necessarily assumed that because we are presenting content that the students and the learners are comprehending or getting it. So we're going to start our activity today talking about six terms that are commonly used in education. So um, the goal of this is that we will present you with two terms and we're going to ask you how familiar you are with these two terms. And if you're watching this as a recording, uh, pause the video to write down a definition for each regardless if you know what the terms are not. And when you've completed that, go ahead and restart the video. Our first two terms are going to be formative assessment and summative assessment. Formative assessment and summative assessment, often two terms that get confused with each other. And actually, uh, I usually tell people, um, very much uh, people who have been teaching for many years sometimes, pause uh, and struggle to define these words themselves. And remember, this is going to be a high level conversation. There are many articles, lots of research, and many professionals who can talk much more in depth about these forms of assessment. And again, these are just um, high level, macro level uh, definitions. So formative assessment. Formative assessment is when you are moderate, monitoring the progress of learning. It's often seen in the moment when you're in the classroom, in the space, and they often have a low stakes component to them. They're usually the questions that you ask students to get a sense if people are on the right track. They're also the questions to, uh, to further pull out from the students more information. Uh, it is often looking to seek improvement or corrective measures um, prior to a summative assessment, but a summative assessment is not necessarily the outcome or the goal of uh, a formative assessment. It really is the process of being able to interact with the students to get a sense if they are on the right track. Also, we can consider these things to be drafts that are ungraded, um, conversations that you're having, review sessions, those kind of things as well, where you're pulling in information and you're kind of checking as we go. Summative assessment is when you are going to evaluate the learning. And again, formative assessment can be the process of being in the classroom that ultimately ties into a summative assessment, but not necessarily. Um, but the goal is to evaluate the learning. And whereas in a formative assessment, I mentioned that it was in the moment. I like to think of summative assessment as measuring against those past moments. So um, this is also often seen as the high stakes um, aspects of um, a coursework, which would be the midterms, the final grades, uh, final exams, uh, final paper, research paper, anything that kind of comes together that measures the actual learning. If you're an accreditation program, the uh, accrediting exam, anything that gets certification, those kind of things are considered summative assessments. They're assessing what actually has been learned. Um, 
They also often use an evaluative method or set learning uh, outcomes as standards. So whether it's you individually creating student learning outcomes, whether it's a department or division expectation or college expectation, but also accreditation boards have that as well. So a lot of times we see summative assessment is really kind of pinpoint the actual learning the, um, and the components that the students learned um, in the course. So formative and summative assessment, brief overview, and much more to come on that in the future. Our second pair of terms are going to be grading and assessing. So again, how familiar are you with these two terms? And again, if you're watching this video, pause the video to write down a definition for each, regardless if you know these terms or not. So let's look at grading and assessing. Grading, uh, by a general definition, would be measurement of completion of tasks, such as attendance, participation, papers, um, things that are turned in, um, and also sometimes uh, non-tangible things such as willingness or um, active uh, engagement with you as the professor or faculty teacher. It's not necessarily an indicator of learning. And taken from uh, Mount Holyoke Community College, I thought this was a really great example of what grading is seen as, as it's summarizing many outcomes for one student. If we go to the other side where we're gonna talk about assessing, assessing really is about monitoring the progress of learning, in, again, in the moment. And um, the biggest thing to be aware about is that it usually is seen as low stakes. It's about seeking improvement or correction prior to a summative assessment. But as before, it's not necessarily, uh, it's not necessary that you have a summative assessment. Um, it really is the conversation about getting out of the students if they're actually uh, learning, uh, if they're on the right track, you're pulling in a uh, conversation with them to just get a sense of where they're at. Um, what I usually get into when we're talking about assessing is that I refer to it as my backpack. I have a backpack with all of these skills that I have. And when I'm asking student questions, sometimes I'm asking them a very plain question um, to get a response. But I may have in my backpack very particular reasons why I'm asking that question. I'm hoping to hear one thing, but I know that I might hear many things. And how would I address them? You get that over time. But you can also kind of try to forecast or predict that. If you yourself was a student, you would know what are the hangups that students come into. If you know that a topic hangs up a student, you can also have in your backpack things, uh, analogies, examples, uh, real world scenarios, things like that that you can pull out. But sometimes when you're asking a student and you're trying to assess where they're at, you kind of need to have kind of those questions that you would ask because you're trying to pull out some specific types of information. Now, um, I thought this was also a really great quote from Mount Holyoke, which was um, assessing is really summarizes one outcome for many students, where grading really is about the uh, grading a student's uh, performance or completion of task. Assessing is really about having a series of outcomes and looking to see um, of those outcomes where students are at and um, getting a sense of that you have one outcome and it is applied to many students and in their progress, where are they at? So grading and assessing. And as I said before, many times you're going to hear more about this. And if you have any questions, you can always reach us at the CODL. Our next and last two sets of terms are going to be objectives and outcomes. Now, I will say this as my caveat is objectives and outcomes are probably much like summative and formative assessment. Easily confused. A lot of people get um, caught up in it. Um, it's uh, frequently used um, at various other websites. I would say I went to a lot of schools and there was um, a very gray area of how people use the word objective versus outcome. So this is going to be one of those things where I'm going to give you a very brief um, perspective of what it is. And then again, we can always do a deeper dive. Additionally, as you go through a program review on this campus or you um, work with Tracy Trottier um, in a assessment, um, you will be able to um, get a better sense of objectives and outcomes. Additionally, if you are in a program with an accreditation standards, you will become very familiar with the difference between outcomes and objectives.
So how familiar are you with these two terms? And if you are watching this video, as always, please pause the video to write down a definition for yourself. And regardless if you know the terms or not, when you're ready, come back to the video and I'll discuss the two terms. Okay, let's dive into the terminology of objectives and outcomes. Now, objectives really are about what the faculty is going to be covering in the class. Um, if I'm going to usually use my common phrases of micro and macro, objectives somewhat are um, do have a, um, uh, a macro level of, they're more of what the faculty kind of strives to do. I often think about it as a presenter of content. Um, if I'm doing a workshop, that um, my objectives are my, the designer or the trainer's objective is to um, do X, Y, and Z. Um, so I often make my objectives about what I'm going to provide in the, in that scenario. But objectives also usually have something to the effect that they're very broad and they often cover like, we'll read historical, uh, materials on, um, not necessarily specific, but very broad and kind of giving the will read, will analyze. Um, the, they're also sometimes seen as guidelines because they don't often have an ability to be truly measured. Um, and so your objectives are kind of more of like what you will cover. Um, so very broad definition of the word objectives. Again, outcomes, outcomes are going to be what the student will be able to do when they leave the class. And often I find myself when writing objectives is to actually have that phrase that when this class is completed, students will be able to. This gives me the opportunity to be very specific about what skills and what particular um, uh, tools they will take with them when they leave this course. So again, it'll be what the students will be able to do, what the students will leave with. They're very specific. They often start with two. So students will be able to recite to identify uh, three types of uh, organisms, uh, those kind of things. And again, they're often measurable. Um, very clear in when you're given outcomes from an accreditation body you know, or an educational um, organization. Sometimes they will have it where it's like guidelines are A, Bs, and Cs, and then there's an A1, an A2, an A3. The outcomes um, usually also you have to meet that particular outcome. Now, writing objectives and writing outcomes is very tricky and takes uh, often some time and some practice. Just like becoming a really good writer, you often need to practice it. So um, I would encourage you that if you want to ask more about outcomes, you can feel free to reach us um, in the Center for Online and Digital Learning, but also that you can speak with your chair, your dean, or Tracy Trottier, um, who works um, in assessment. Now that we've reviewed the six terms as part of the activity, I just wanted to go over um, one of the things that most commonly comes up when we're talking about assessment. And again, because assessment sometimes gets confused between that formative and summative, I wanted to give you some examples of strategies. So the road to assess is paved with tests. Nope, strategies. So um, these are commonly things you can do both in and outside of a classroom. They can be done regardless of your mode, online, hybrid, supplemental, uh, and in the, in the actual classroom if you are teaching a lecture class. I'm going to start with some examples, just kind of go over some stuff. But if you have any um, further questions, you can always feel free to reach out to us. So the first one I'm going to talk about are ABCD cards. Now, old school, this is something that you could just get a series of uh, index cards. If you can get color ones, those would be helpful. Um, what you do is you, each student gets four cards. They have a, a label on them that says A, B, C, and D. If you can get four colored kind of cards, um, you'd be able to have A's be one color, B's be another, C's be one, and D, etc., etc. Um, what the value of this is going to be is that when you're in the classroom space, um, you would be able, and you can also do this online. It's very old school online. If you have students have their camera on, um, or they can use the chat. Um, what will happen is, is that um, you will be able to ask a question of students. Say you have a multiple choice question. And then what you want to do is ask the question and ask the students to put up a card. If the cards all say A, B, or C, or D, then you know the appropriate response. If they're color coded, that might be an easier indicator if you can use color as an indicator as a teacher. 
If you also want to have, um, are every, is everybody getting it? You can also just say, put up your A card. Additionally, you can use the A and D cards for agree and disagree of if you wanted to ask questions that are um, uh, for the purpose of having, do you agree with this statement? Do you not agree with this statement? So a um, really old school, like I said, way of um, doing kind of a, a formative assessment in the classroom, you getting a sense of where students are at. But again, the questions that you're asking are also incredibly important, not just asking questions and having cards up in the air. Uh, the parking lot, a uh, parking lot is when you actually create a public space in the classroom, whether it's uh, in a chat or it's on a whiteboard or a um, chalkboard. But what it is, it's a public space that questions that aren't relevant in the moment can be revisited. This is where you just put the parking lot up and you or the student, when a student asks a question that is tangential or is not relevant to the conversation, can be put up on the board. This means that A, you don't forget to go back and revisit it at the end of the class, but also that when it does come up, you'll see it if it is relevant, and also that you can have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with the student if it isn't something that you're going to discuss with the rest of the class. So it's a really good opportunity also to give the students the understanding that their question is still valid and that making sure that maybe their question is also going to prevent any further confusion about the particular learning material you're covering. Class study cards, this can be basically, you know, a study guide, but what you would do is you'd have at the end of class, students create a study card and then turn them in, they could put their name on it, and then you can um, check through and see if the students are getting the concepts, if you want to make it broader, and then that way you have study cards where you maybe photocopy um, or you take a picture of the card, and then the students have um, the card that probably best represents it, kind of can be um, a award challenge game kind of thing as well, um, or you could do this with a collective doc where the students are putting up their definitions and then you can kind of comment back and forth on which ones are the best and kind of come up with a collective um, definition um, that they could use for studying. Covering stuck in the mud. So stuck in the mud is when a student, and it's all students, not just one, they name the hardest concept that was covered in class that day or that are being covered in class in general and what they're stuck on. And so what this does is it doesn't ask one student to be targeted out. It actually puts out that maybe all students are struggling. If you do have a student who's not struggling, that is your going to teachable moment where that student is also maybe one of the people who's going to take a lead on presenting concepts or encouraging them to learn because we do know that when someone learns something and then is able to learn how to teach it, they themselves learn the concept better. Think pair share. This is an old school standard. Um, it's K through 12 and higher ed. Think pair share is when you pose a question, you let each student think about it and reflect, take notes, then you pair them up and then they discuss. They come up with a um, summative answer to a uh, summer summary answer together and then they report out. This is really great because it allows individual reflection. It allows um, interpersonal and intrapersonal communication. And then it also has you being aware of the larger class and group communication. The last topic is going to be concept maps. Concepts maps are when students draw connections and relationships to the concepts being presented. So this is where um, you can have something that might have a sequence um, or a strategy and then have the students outline it to show them what that is. You can draw it really quickly. You can ask a student to come up to the board, um, any kind of thing like that. You can also start the map yourself. You can have the group come up and do a concept map together on a whiteboard. And it's a few minute activity to make sure that kind of everyone's on the play, everyone can get the marker, whatever the case might be. Additionally, online, you could also do this with a whiteboard. You can uh, do this with a Jamboard if you're familiar with that as a Google tool. There's different ways that you can do maps. A lot of times you'll hear these as kind of brainstorming maps um, and they're very similar. You can also do these in other topics in history. If you're doing something where students have to know the progression of a particular um, historical event, um, they can draw out that map and then make the connections of how something related to something else. So those are going to be some strategies for you to think about. This is a way of getting away from doing quick quizzes, pop quizzes, those kind of things as well. It's ways for you to be engaged with the student in the classroom and maybe gamifying it a little bit, but also letting them know that this is a space where they can learn and that you're kind of also shaking up the environment a little bit to make it more of a community of learners and um, a less of a just a classroom of space. So. We're going to cover, um, we're, we're completed with our presentation today and we're going to move on to the next couple sections, um, oldies but goodies. 
As usual, we do talk about the academic uh, calendar and semester tasks. We are doing this uh, presentation in the fall of 2022. As you've seen, more things are added to the map uh, uh, into our little scale here. And what you're going to see is that we've completed midterm grading and um, we still have spring teaching assignments that are being worked out. But this is that moment where you start to think about what else. And some of this is going to be department and division specific. But what you want to do is just be aware that we are coming into the window of time where there is a greater sense of fatigue people are running longer into the semester and that also we are coming into areas where we have breaks and holidays and time off um, and so making sure that people are rested but also when people come back that they're still motivated to do their work probably the most collective um, amount of things are being due at this time a lot of times people do have uh, students doing midterm exams and then we are rolling into any type of final projects final exams or any type of final papers. So just being aware of that and also taking into consideration personal um, and uh, mental health time constraints. So be aware of that as well, but also think about the things you may need to complete as a faculty member. Our teaching challenge this week is going to be covering um, the 33 Strategies book and we're gonna cover strategy 14, which is on page 58. Remind students about requirements and grading criteria, including anything that affects their grades, such as attendance, late policies. They've just completed midterms. If they're not doing so well, probably a reminder would be really helpful. You can send this out as a collective um, email. You can also um, be nuanced with who got what midterm grade to also either send encouragement, send concern, or actually try to talk about um, ways of them being able to improve their performance. Strategy 20 on page 75, encourage students to go to all their professors and SI office hours for all of their classes, especially with the increases of papers, tests, and presentations that uh, increase throughout the semester. Using the prompts on page 78, you might want to also consider providing them with guidance on how that they can learn more from their faculty, both professionally and academically. And with that, we have completed the presentation assessment of student learning for this week. Thank you so much for your time and attention. If you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at the Center for Online and Digital Learning at digitallearning at stick.edu. Thank you.